Today is the 19th anniversary of the passing of an Arsenal legend, David Rocastle, and to talk about him, to talk about his legacy and why he is a figure who is remembered with such love and fondness among Arsenal fans, there's only one person uh, we could talk to today, and that, of course, is Ian Wright. Ian, how are you? I'm very good, Andrew. How are you doing this morning? Not, you good? Yeah, I'm not bad. I'm not bad. You know, I think we're all we're all doing our bit to to stay yeah. out of mischief and stay out of trouble in these yeah. strange times. Um, <laughs> <laughs> how are you doing today? Because it must be a, a you know a day which yeah. evokes a lot of memories for you. It is. It is a day, and it's it's a it's a nice day. You know, the sun's just starting to shine. You kind of the reflection. It's, it gets easier every year. But what um you know, I mean you speak to the family, I speak to the family at some stage today. We speak all the time. Me and the me and the girls and mm. his ex missus. His son's away at the minute in America, he's stuck in America at a minute, Ryan. But mm. you know, um it's like like I say, for me, you know, it's an everyday thing. You know, I think about him every single day. And what's good about um being able to post and let people know, Andrew, and what I would like to urge Arsenal fans is to stop shouting people down that don't know him talking about a long time you know i mean we're still because of what i do and and my presence on social media and that there's generations of arsenal fans there's generations of arsenal fans that that don't know they never saw me play they only saw what was on there so Mm. for people to be shouting people down because they they say who is he what what's this thing you know i mean they say how can you not know him it's easy to not know him and this is why for me it's pleasurable to be able to on a day like today, yeah. the anniversary, like you're saying, like, is to put stuff up. And then when you look at Twitter and you see so many of the the, the the things that people are posting as well, some of his skills, some of his goals, what he was about, you know, coming through the youth team and and everything, you know. The thing with it, Andrew, is 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 that um, to, to jump back to when we were kids, is that, like I say, David used to always talk to me when he was about 15 and he used to be leaving Broccoli to go across to um, the, the main part of Broccoli, um, Crofton Park, to get the 171, or I think it was the 141, Stoke Newington. Mm. Um, you know what I mean? And that's where I used to meet him. And, you know, at that stage, Andrew, we were only thinking that, yeah, he's just at Arsenal, but nothing's going to happen because nothing happens for people from here at a club like Arsenal. And, you know, he's 15, having to go all that way, you know. And then for him to turn out to be the legend he was at Arsenal because he was such a great player, yeah. You know what I mean? Such an unbelievable team, team person, teammate, loved his teammates, great player. Is why, you know what I mean? I'm just so proud of him and, and, and of his legacy. Sure. Can I ask you something? Because, um, you know, he was 15 when he was joining Arsenal and you're a few years older than yeah, than he 19. is. So, you know, when you're when you're younger, age difference is is big, you know, it doesn't matter if someone's 40 yeah. or 45 now, it's like, yeah, we're all, yeah. we're all the same, but 15 and 19 yeah. or whatever it might be. That's a, that's a, a big difference back then. And, you know, you've always spoken about what an inspiration he was for you, uh, you know, growing yeah. up and as a footballer. But when you think about it, it, it almost should have been the other way around simply because age dictates that, that mindset. Was that something that was always there or was it as you grew up, you kind of realized what, what, a, what an influence he had been on you despite the age difference, despite the fact he was the younger guy and in some ways you're, yeah. you're not supposed to, you're not supposed to no. look up to the young guy? No. Well, well obviously, we both grew up on, on Roker State and – because, like I said, I was like 18, 19, David was 15 at the time. But, like, when you go back even further, so when I was like 14, David's 10. Mm. And, like, he always he, he tells a story that when they used to, he used to come up to the park, we used to have a crematorium at the top of Honor Oak Estate. And that's where everybody used to go to play. But, like, obviously, he's 10, him and his dear friend Kevin Arnold, who passed as well. Um, they used to come up there just to go on the swings. But because we were like 14, 13, and 14s, and David was 10, we'd, we'd say, right, you in goal, you in the other goal. <laughs> and so he would be in goal. But what he would do on so many occasions, and we're talking about playing against 13 and 14-year-olds, he'd do that rush goalie thing, Andrew, where he'd get the <laughs> ball, throw it down, and go through the whole team score and run back in, run back in the goal. Um, and we always knew, like I say, I was the guy at the, the, the older age where he was the, 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 the good player in the state, mm. but he was the, the, of his age group. He was the he was the he was the brilliant he was brilliant in respect of technical ability he, he pissed on everybody um, and and me everybody in on in the old estate 
But then once we saw him go to Arsenal, and like I say, at the time I was a bit of a, a rogue. I was doing all my stuff. I was youth clubbing. I just got mm. involved with girls. I was going to dances. I was playing football on a on a on a Saturday. Um, you know, uh, on on like for instance, on a Friday night, I go out all night. Friday night, go straight to football, play football on Saturday, mm. and then go out um, go out Saturday night and stay till the early hours in the morning. Go straight from the party to the fo- Sunday morning match and then go to sleep <laughs> after that. And like, I used that's how my life was. But David <laughs> was already a professional, Andrew. Yeah. He was already a professional in his head. He's 15. And I remember I used to come across the bridge from uh, coming from the youth club and David would be like, you know, getting ready to go to training at Arsenal in the evening or in the afternoon or he'd have to go to the ground for the games. And he'd always stop me, Andrew, telling me that you're, I'm, I'm playing now. I've, I've just started playing in and around the first team. I'm playing against people in the reserves. And they're not as good as you. You need to do more to get into the game. I say to him, I don't know what more to do. Apart from like not go to a party on a Friday night and a Saturday night and that well, kind of stuff. Well, those are the things that he was saying to me. <laughs> that's, well, that's what he was saying, Andrew. In, no, it, that was the things he was saying to me. Mm. He said, listen, you've got to, it's up to you to want to do it more. You've got to find a way to make it happen because there's a life there for you but you're wasting your life doing what you're doing, the smoking, the women, the drinking, the youth club, you know, all that stuff that you do at the youth club. You know what I mean? I, I, he, he used to stop me on the bridge before he'd got, and then he'd say, listen, I've got to go. Remember, he's 15, I was 19. I, I listened to him because you respect him because you respected what he was doing. He already had a professional attitude about him. And you know what I mean? I knew that he was right, Andrew. That's the thing. I knew he was right. Yeah, I mean... But I remember, I was 19. I think I'm not long... Not long come out of prison with the with the Chelmsford, mm. with, the, with the with the fine stuff that I went into into prison for, and so obviously when you see him, he's saying, "Listen, you got to do something. You got to try. You got to try harder." I said, "I don't know what more to do." You know what I mean? It's, you know what I mean? And he kind of said, "You know, you're going out all the time. You're always going out." And, and to be honest, David, as when we got older, he's somebody that liked going out. He sacrificed a lot of that. He liked going out once we started, once we got together at Arsenal, and even when I was at Palace and he was at Arsenal because mm. he was a Crystal Palace supporter. You know what I mean? We used to meet after games and we'd go out, me, him, Mickey, sometimes Kevin. You know what I mean? We'd go out, go out to all those clubs, those little reggae clubs, because he loved his reggae music and stuff like that. And we'd go out because he loved it. But is it, there's a time. There was a time for it. And his time was making sure that he buckled down and he was uh, professional enough to get to being yeah. um, a professional player in the first team. And I remember when Pat Rice tells the story about sitting in that room with a bunch of 16, 17-year-olds, and he said, listen, at the moment, every single one of you is costing us money. Which one of you do you think is going to be in our first team? Which one of you is going to get in our first team? David was the only one who put his arm up. So he, he said, had, I'll get into the first team. He had the confidence. He had the confidence and the drive. Mm. And the, like I say, he had a professional attitude, and he was very dedicated, majorly dedicated, especially coming off of our estate, you know what I mean? To go and do what he's doing. I mean, to leave our estate, go all the way to Colney, which for me at 19 would have felt like I'm going to the other end of the earth. Yeah. You know, he was doing it of, He was doing it from the age of 14. Classic sort of um, wise head or old head on young shoulders, isn't it? And and yeah, I think every, everybody listening to this, you know, uh, will have uh, experienced to some extent that thing in your teenage years where – you know, you play football your whole life, but you discover, like you say, girls and drinking cans in the park with your mates and stuff like that. And, and uh, you know, when everybody else is doing something, it takes a, a tremendous amount of willpower, doesn't it, to do it differently? Because, you know, again, yeah. going back to that age thing, you're viewed differently. Like if you're really good at school, for example, you're the, the yeah. nerd or whatever it is. But if that's your dedication yeah. to have the, the, the self-belief and the confidence to, to yeah. live your life in that way you know, says a lot about you. It does say a lot about you and you get the benefits from it because obviously David started doing it from a young age. And then obviously once I did get into Crystal Palace, all of a sudden the the, the light switch comes on, you realise the chance that you've got, you realise that it's all in your hands. Like I said, David used to come and watch me at Palace when we was in second division trying to get into the first division. Mm. You know, Mickey, him and Mickey would come. I'd go to watch Arsenal games and, um, you know, it, that's when well, that's when it started to happen to me. I started to act like David was already acting when he was 15. I started to act properly, making sure that I stayed in at rights, no going out, no messing around, you know, eased off on the women a bit. 
that sort of stuff. You know what I mean? It's one of the least, the, the things I should have gave up more at that time, if I'm going to be totally honest, the mm. women. But the fact <laughs> is, but the fact is, Andrew, is that my, my, my professional outlook totally changed and I turned into literally a, um, a, a, a machine, practicing, practicing, because I, I wanted to play for Arsenal. I wanted to be in the first in the first division. I was hoping it was going to be Arsenal. In the end, God, you know what I mean? God willing, it was. But I just was desperate to play with him and be with him. Um, I didn't think it was going to happen, Andrew. Mm. Um, I think there was one time I got in trouble at Palace because I mentioned one time, because David used to come to the games and, you know what I mean, obviously being be not as um, clued up as I am now in respect to media savvy, how I should have been, you know, saying, oh God, I'd love to play for Arsenal one day. Went crazy. Yeah. Everybody went crazy. Yeah. Crystal Palace went crazy. Perry Groves, you know what I mean? Perry, I think one, I think Perry Groves said something about um, your, your mates out of order to David Rowcutt, to David, to me. And I said, well, you know, I don't mean like, oh, but of course I'd love to play for Arsenal, thinking that it was never going to happen, Andrew. But mm. in the end, you know what I mean? Obviously, we, we, we end up getting there. But the fact is, is, is the attitude I'm talking about, the professionalism that I needed to try to get to a level to then get to play with and with those guys and against those guys. Because remember, that Arsenal team when David broke in and then we're talking 89, going through with Tony and Merce and Michael mm. Thomas and all that got come through, Lee Dixon coming into the team, Boldy. It was a magnificent team. And so you're thinking, gosh, man, that team is so good. So you're, I'm already look. I was looking up to, to David and Arsenal yeah. when I was at Palace because obviously been and so so they were at a different attitude and I wanted to get to that same level of attitude. The you know your path to to Arsenal was very different to David's obviously and you know it took you longer to establish yourself as a as a professional footballer. You know you've spoken about that a, a number of times about you know your your kind of last real chance at it with Crystal Palace and and you yeah. know it came later in your life and what have you and uh, at the same time you're trying to make this happen and you're looking at what David is doing and playing for Arsenal and winning things and and you know um he was an incredible talent. We'll talk about him as a player right now but but mm. where where's the line between like like you know what you know the way sometimes you've got a mate and you're in the same business and they do really well and you're like well fair fucks I'm really happy for you but at the same time god yeah. damn I'm a little bit jealous of that um you know that that doesn't necessarily have to be a negative thing it can be a positive thing it can be something that drives you is that the way it was for you when you were looking at David and when you were looking at him playing in the red and white and and playing what? at Highbury was it like okay great and I, I'd love to be with you but but the sort of the desire the there's a there's a certain amount of of envy if you like and that can yeah. be your motivating what? factor well, what happened was, is that obviously, remember, when Dave, when I was like 19, Dave was 15 years at Arsenal, I was nowhere near it. Mm. So all you're hoping is that for him to go on and be that one, what everybody's thinking is going to happen, you're going to get someone off the estate who's going to be amazing and, and makes it. So at the time, so I admired him then. When I got into the game, I was still always looking up to him simply because he was at a level that I hadn't got to. So it wasn't a case of envy, it was a case mm. of his... He's um, the position that he was in and how well he was playing just continuously drove me on to be better, to try and get there. So he was always the, he was always the the the, the bar for me to try and reach mm. in respects of ability wise and 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 output and and consistency. So it wasn't ever a case of envious and jealousy. It was always a case of always trying to to get to him. So I was just he, he pulled me along, yeah. Andrew. He kept setting the bar he higher. Me, yeah. He set the bar higher. It wasn't like me and David were both 15, went to Arsenal and they chose him over me. That, mm. that would be something that probably somebody would be a little bit more envious and jealous over. But the fact that because I was older and I always always looked up to him even though he was 15 and I was 19, and even though he's always younger than me and I was, I was the older person, I always looked up to him because of the levels that he'd reached so quickly. And so I was always able to learn from him. And, you know, you're learning everything, mm. talking about what you're talking about, somebody that when we used to go out when I was at Palace and he was at Arsenal, obviously, remember, he was a national figure then. We'd go out and he would literally get mobbed, Andrew, and he'd sign every single paper. And he'd always say afterwards, listen, it takes me 10, 15 seconds. It lasts them forever. Never, ever don't give fans um, the time. Never. And that is why they still sing his name. Yeah. I know we're going to go on to it. Sure. But that's one of the reasons. But I'm explaining to people. He always, and you know, you hear people say things like this when people have passed. Oh, he was so generous, so kind. No one can have a bad word 
to say about David Rollcastle in all the football clubs he's been to, yeah. all the football fans he's met, because that is what he was about. Yeah, I, I mean, was always trying to. I was always trying to please him. That's yeah. I mean, you talk about uh, what, what he did for you as a footballer, but what you know, his influence on you as a person is yeah. obvious as well, right? Yeah. Well, it is Andrew simply because remember for a long time I was a. I was like I said, I was a rogue. I, I didn't, I didn't. My mind wasn't even nowhere near where David was when he was thirteen, fourteen, mm. and fifteen. That yes, I could play football. I was okay, and you know what I mean. It was fine because there was a load of play, people on our estate, Andrew, who could play football, and we was okay. But with me, I just had the, I, my my mindset was I'm trying to find a decent job, so as I can buy my nice gear and what I want to buy, and you know, play football on a Sunday, go out, and like, that's what that's where my mind was. Till I started to speak to David, and then you st- then you started to do the. Um, then I started got a decent job. Then I started playing for a better Sunday morning team and Saturday team, and all of a sudden you're playing in games and finals, Andrew, where semi pro teams and top teams are watching mm. the games, and then all of a sudden you're starting to play at a higher level, and you're scoring. I'm still scoring three and four goals a game, you know, stuff like that. I used to say to David when he used to speak to me, I'm still scoring. He said, yeah, because that game's definitely too easy for you. <laughs> to go to, he'd say that you need to go to a better team. So I'm thinking, yeah, but David, I'm scoring three and four goals a game. He said, yeah, but the team's too easy. It's rubbish. You're playing against rubbish. And so, you know what I mean? You're constantly, so you think to yourself, so you, whatever happens, Andrew, you go away and you think, yeah, to be honest, he is right. He is right. So I, I got into a team, like the team I got into was 10 MB. Mm. And that was a good football team. And we did win a lot of things. And it was from Ten and B where I went to Crystal Palace, because the players and the and the older black guys who were in that team were 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 professional people. There was had lawyers, you know what I mean. We had like bricklayers, we had doctors. There was everybody, everybody who was in and around there had a professional attitude, and it was exactly what I needed. I was playing in a football team with people that 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 were very driven and very determined and very motivated, and it was the best thing that could have happened to me. And my mate Conrad, who came and played with us, played with Ten and B at the time as well. You know, so mm. that's um, so for me, Andrew. My mind was all over the place, and it was starting to happen. And then it just, you know, just slowly I was starting to bottleneck into the right path. Then I got down there, and then all of a sudden, you know, what I mean, I'm 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 doing a decent job, and you know, we win a couple of finals. I score a couple of goals in them, and Crystal Palace um, want me to have a trial, and it literally happened like that. What was David's reaction to you signing he for was, Crystal Palace? Oh fuck, I mean, Andrew! <laughs> I swear to God, it, I could, he, I, if he couldn't have been happier. It was unbelievable. I remember when, when, because um, obviously I, I got signed for three months, and afterwards I saw him. He gave me, he, he hugged me so tightly when I told him, and I said, you know, when when I told him I've signed for Palace for three months, and I said it's only three months. He hugged me so tightly. He was so proud of me. He was so happy that I made it, Andrew. He was so happy that I got there for three months. I said, yeah, but David, it's only three months. said, it doesn't matter. You're going to be fine. And then he started to tell me about what I have to do. You have to stay behind. Because remember, Andrew, I ain't got a clue. Mm. You know what I mean? I was I was starting to train at Crystal Palace. And like we started training at 10.30. And remember, I was, still, I was working from 7.30 in the morning. So I get to Crystal Palace at like quarter to eight. Mm. And no one's there. I'm sitting in the canteen on my own for a couple of hours they don't start training till 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 10 30 so then i had to look at the because i don't even realize taking the train to get there so i had to look at the train and find i could get that train i could get a later train i don't need to but i was so eager to be there on time and then what would happen andrew is that once they finished you're getting these reserve players and the first team players doing this so you see a couple of them doing stuff they just leave and i'm thinking well what do i do now some of the times i'm getting in at seven eight o'clock at night i've finished at 12 so I just started practicing, and that's what he told me to do: practice on everything, practice on every single thing you can. The heading, the scoring, making sure you're in the box, making sure you're scoring goals, making sure you hit the target. He just told me everything, Andrew. And so I would never leave Crystal Palace's training ground before three, four o'clock. Never. Practice, practice, practice. Because when I was playing the Sunday morning football, like he said, it was too easy. And I remember, like one of the times I. I was playing in a game, Andrew, and I think I scored four goals or five goals. And in the end, I started trying to hit the post with my shots or <laughs> to see if I can hit the bar with the shots, see if I can hit the post and go in, see if I can flick it up and volley it. And so it, so mm. in the end, it was, right, it was too easy. 
But now, all of a sudden, Andrew, I'm in a position where I can have 10 balls this side, 10 balls that side. I can get a youth team player from the right back or the left back, left wing or left, getting them to cross balls so I can head. All of a sudden, Andrew, everything what he was saying to me about practising and be be- getting better, getting better, getting better was happening. Yeah, I mean, the, you, happening. you're talking about the challenges. You're having to make your own challenges at that level, whereas the challenge when you step up is from the other team. It's from your teammates as well, oh, because yeah. the level of player yeah. is, is yeah. so much higher and you've got to prove yourself to them. Um, let's talk about yeah. David as as a player. Yeah. How would you how would you describe what he could do um, with the ball <laughs> and without the ball? Because, oh, you know, Jesus. Uh, look, if you've seen him play, you, you know what a skillful player he was as well. But I think let's try and put it in the context of of the era that it took place in, you know, the late eighties, early nineties, you know, we talk about football nowadays being a a physical game, but by that, I think we, we mean fitness, we mean stamina, we mean, you know, players having to press uh, for 90 minutes, players having to stay in position, you know, that kind of physical work that you've got to do in the modern game with the, the the pace of it and everything else, obviously a challenge, but this was a different era as well, where, you know, the pitches were heavy. um, They weren't great at times. And there was a oh. physical element to the game, which wasn't yeah. simply how far you could run or how how much you could run. It was how many kicks you could take and how could you stand exactly. up for yourself in that. So you know, let's talk about and, him as a player first, yeah, you know, and what he could do on the ball, and then and then his ability to yeah. to demonstrate that within that era. Well, the thing is, Andrew, is that we're talking about an era where if you could. If you could do the things that David Rocast could do with the ball, how quick he was with the ball, mm. his feet were quick, he could go past people, his crossing was amazing. The first thing you're going to get people are going to try and hammer into you. But like the thing what, with him is that people like Pat Van den Howe and Stuart Pearce, he wasn't afraid of them because anybody who knew David Rocast from the time I knew, he was hard as nails. He was a hard nut. He was somebody that he could look after himself. So he was somebody that wasn't bothered about people flying in and kicking him. All he all he cared about is and his engine getting back. So he could he had the skills to go and take people on, mm. and he could take a challenge, and he would challenge people, and he could get back. You know, you listen to someone like Lee Dixon. You know, people. I remember George Graham one time saying that Lee Dixon got into the England team off of the back of the hard work that David Rowcastle does in front of him. Mm. Because that's what he'd done. This is what David Rocastle could do. He could, like I say, he could, he could be a winger. Remember, at the latter stages, he went centre midfield as well. Mm. That's how good technically. That's how good technically he was when he got a little bit heavier with the knee. When his knee started to cause him a bit of problems, he went into the midfield. But as, as a winger, with, what, what, the, the form that got him into the England side, there was no one, no one as good as David Rocastle. You know, you look at some some of the goals what he scored with that right foot what he had and the skills. Mm. The one he scored against Middlesbrough, the goal up at Liverpool in the League Cup. You know, the way he could get himself into the box, like the goal against Tottenham in the semi-final of the League Cup as well. You know, he was somebody that could do everything. So he could do it from the wing and cross. He could be, he can arrive into the box and finish like he did um, against, uh, like I say, like against Tottenham. He could get one on the edge of the box against Liverpool and before United, bam, flashed. It's in the back of the net. Everything. He could do everything um, because he had the skill, he had the stamina, he had the strength, he had everything. You said earlier on that nobody in football has a bad word to say about David Rocastle. And obviously that's a testament to his character and what a what a man he was. But you also talk about how tough he was and how he wouldn't um, back down. And it's rare, isn't it, for somebody to be able to combine those two things yeah. to be that kind of a good guy but also somebody yeah. who will absolutely stick up for their teammates i think there's that that quote where he talks about the the brawl at old trafford and he said yeah. you know at arsenal we never started any brawls we just finished them and finished. you know that they, <laughs> you know and that's fair isn't it i mean that's kind of what you had to do i mean if your focus is on your yeah. team and it's on your teammates and it's it's the togetherness and the solidarity of the dressing room you can be the yeah. nicest man in the world but on the pitch if you want to be a success and if you want to be a, a real proper teammate you've got to be willing to you know to stand up and and to put yourself just in a stand- position where you know well, you've got Dennis Irwin by well, the throat at Old Trafford Absolutely, absolutely. Um, and and the thing about it is, is um, people like him who came through with Tony Adams and Mickey Thomas, and then you know you, you, you're talking about players with a, a, 
a winning mentality. They want to win. And they're not they're not shirkers. They're not going to shirk. Tony's not going to shirk. Mickey Thompson ain't going to shirk. Mm. David Rocaston ain't going to shirk. And what happens is, is that the only, the only saving grace for Man United um, with, with that with the big brawl is that I signed a year later. Yeah. Because that would have been right <laughs> up my street. Because there's a there's a couple of the guys in that team. Someone like Brian McLear, those little sure. sneaky people. I saw them sneaking on the edge, seeing people digging out someone like Anders, and that would have been something that David would have been absolutely livid with mm. is that people continuously digging into Anders and Anders shirking away because he was somebody that if it got a little bit tough, Anders, and this is where you can compare the two, as a winger, David Rowcastle, you know, you could kick him and he's coming back for more. With Anders, you kick him and he's literally out of the game. And what David would have done in that respect was if people are kicking Anders, he would feel like he has to try and protect him. That's just sure. natural. Sure. You have to try and protect him because that's what happened up there. And so he's in there, he's straight in there. And to be fair, it's how you should be for your team. It's how your whole team should be. No one, as much as, yes, you, you're always going to have a, a certain weak link in there. And, 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 you know, you've got to make sure that you're together. So if it happens, you're in together. It's mm. something that is, was, was synonymous with us back in the day. Sure. So um, his Arsenal career um, was affected quite badly by by a knee injury um and that it... was a knee injury Andrew. i've got to just clear something up with that that was something that they took the whole of his cartilage out at 17 you know what i mean wow. that, so you know that 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 was that was a big mistake um from arsenal's point of view um because it's something that he was he always had problems with it and it could tell him without a shadow of a doubt it curtailed him. It slowed him way down. That's why I say he went into the into the midfield. But that was something that was, for me, that was something that should never have happened. It, that would not have needed to happen. Yeah. Well, um, I mean, in the modern the, era, wouldn't it? There would be right a different. Circumstance. There yeah. would be a different way yeah. of dealing so, with that. Absolutely. Yeah. So, when um, you joined. Arsenal from Crystal Palace and I know people will have seen the documentary that was out last year or the year before um, on BT Sport you talk about being in his house and sitting down the two of you just talking excitedly about what you were going to do at Arsenal together yeah. and being there together and, and everything else I mean you didn't have a great deal of time there I think it was one season um, one season one season together um, how do you I mean I guess you can look at it in two ways. One, regret, obviously, that you didn't get more time to play together. And obviously, because of David's injury and his knee problems and everything else, um, he was um, badly affected by that and his career sort yeah. of meandered away a little bit. Yeah. But is there also the, the the other side of it where you go, wow, at least we had that one year. That was like dream yeah. come true kind of stuff. It was I, honestly now, Andrew. As time's gone by, um, like I said, I had to do something for the Desert Island Discs, and um, I remember yeah, um, I heard it. I said, I yeah, I said, I said, Andrew, if I, I did say, you know, what I mean, I would have given anything for another another year with my dear friend, and obviously mm. I would have. But for us to come from where we came from to get that one year, and Andrew, if I'm going to be totally honest, we didn't win anything in my first year at Arsenal. I did win the Golden Boot, but I can't remember playing football like I did in that year, any other time in my life. It was the greatest, um, greatest season in my, in my life going to Arsenal. It was all being realised, you know, with my dear friend scoring, winning the golden boot that year with him in the team, you know, him, me, him setting, setting me up to score and on, on numerous occasions mm. um, for that, for that to happen, you know, but it, the, the sad thing about it is, Andrew, I remember going into training, um, the morning, th that particular morning. And when I went into training, David was outside pacing around in, in a, in a s s little square, like, and I could, you know what I mean? Like, he looked agitated and he was crying. When I went cl close to him, he was crying. And, um, I thought, oh, I thought, fuck, you know, someone's died. And when he, he said, um, he said through, bro through that broken cry voice, um, They've accepted an offer and he's going to Leeds. And I, I broke down into tears instantly. And, you know, as much as, you know, you, you hear it and you say it, that's drastic, dramatic mm. reaction from me um, about someone thinking somebody died. It felt, it felt like it, Andrew. 
I might, I don't know, you know, I, I've had feelings of, of news when people have told you that and it wasn't too dissimilar. Yeah. I was, I, my heart broke instantly. I went straight, it went straight to tears and we was hugged for a while. I remember going in and, you know, when I saw, you know, I didn't, I did because I didn't understand properly. And I said, like, well, why are we selling him? I remember going in to see George Graham. I couldn't quite contain myself. I remember Tony Adams had to speak to me. They give me that talk of, you know, things happen, people move on. It's okay. To the point, you know, to the point where David said, No, it's fine, I'm fine. Because I found it you know something, Andrew? What what happened was I never thought I wasn't gonna be playing with him for the whole time as Arsenal. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Until until that moment. So all of a sudden, you know, I, the last thing I'm expecting is for him to, to be to be moving on. It was it was it was the furthest thing from your mind, and this is why I, I kind of equate to the, to the same level as you know hearing somebody has died, because you're totally not expecting it, and it took me, um, it took me a little, a little while to get over it in respect of him not being there. Did, who did you, <clears throat> did you feel in any way resentful? You know, towards not the, the, the a little the bit resentful to George. Yeah, I did. Yeah, I did, Andrew. Towards that, towards George Graham, did you come because to understand was, um, it? You have to understand it, Andrew. Um, but I think that the only reason why I was resentful because in the end, these things happen and people are coming through, and you know, you know, people like Ray Parler are coming through, and things like this, and playing in centre midfield, and we saw what career he went on to have. And yes, you do understand in the end that those things have to happen, and it's all about progression. But I think my problem, maybe, was the way George Graham. Used to treat people and speak to people and shun people mm. and things like that. And you see, when you see that, and you see the arguments that him and him, him and the boss had at the time, and you could feel like, you know, so you can feel like there's a, there was a, I don't know, there, there was they, they they were always at loggerheads to, towards the end there, and so I, I I was it was quite difficult for me to get over because I thought he's just sold him because he he doesn't like him anymore. Yeah. Not for not for the footballing reasons that had to probably happen. Yeah, because you thought it was, it was all a personal. Yeah, thing, it was yeah. all kind of like yeah, it was all kind of for me. My mind was made up on that, and I was kind of and I was vexed with the boss for a while. Mm. You know, I was vexed with him for a while. You know what I mean? It was it wasn't like oh, three weeks, four weeks. I was vexed with him for you know what I mean? It just always and you know what I mean. Him used to have blazing arguments <laughs> with George Graham. <laughs> <laughs> Honestly, blazing arguments. I don't doubt Real you. nasty stuff. You know what I mean? To the point where you'd have to call me in on a Monday and then I'd have to apologise to to him in front of the boys um, on, on 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 at, at training because we used to sit on that bench and he'd have to apologise to him because I wouldn't say it's just because of that, but some of the times and what I've learned being a player and what I learned from Arsene Wenger is that he didn't have to be as nasty as some managers were. You didn't have to be as vindictive and malicious and and vociferous in the way you spoke to people and, and the way you treated people who were just trying to play football and do their stuff just because you may not like them mm. at that time or they may have done something wrong. And, and, and I always found that, um, if I ever was a manager, something I would never, ever treat people like I saw certain people get treated in that time. Mm. And so that's why I was a little bit, um, I was a little bit torn up about the whole thing. Um, what would you say to people now um, when we look back on this 19 years later? You know, there are a lot of people listening to this who will have um, lived through that era and seen David Rowcastle play and, um, you know, seen the joy that he brought to fans and, and to the club. But equally, there are new generations of fans, fans who have come to the team and come to football late. And one of the great things about... Uh, football and Arsenal is that we have this uh, amazing fan base all over the world. Yeah. Um, yeah. From every corner of the globe. And, you know, Arsenal is a North London club and you can be a hero in North London, but David Rocastle's name is sung far and wide and far beyond yeah. that. And, and how does it make you feel when you hear that chant go out? How does it make you feel to know that people who perhaps years ago had no concept of Arsenal or football yeah. look at David Rocastle and understand, if not necessarily know him or what he did, but understand his place in Arsenal's history as a, a great player and a great man? Um, 
<laughs> well, it, well, firstly, obviously, very proud. Um, you know, I tell you what's really, what's really nice, Andrew. Any time I'm at the Emirates and they start singing "Oh Rocky, 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 Rock Castle," sometimes sitting there, maybe one of his, one of his kids. It's it really is a beautiful thing, and he is somebody that the fans have taken as our icon and as a legend that they they do continuously sing his name. You know, we we hear like at Manchester United they're still singing Cantona's name. I still think it's the it's the it's the ultimate I think um appreciation when uh football fans twenty years on are still singing your name. Mm. You know, to, to, uh, to try and explain, it's very difficult to me to explain but uh, how proud I am of the fact that his legacy is what it is at Arsenal. Because remember, everything what we're seeing, you know, today's going to be quite an emotional day. You're seeing all the stuff every on, on social media. But like I say, I always go back to the 15-year-old who's given me advice, seeing what people think of him now globally. And this is why I'm saying at the start of our conversation, is I don't want Arsenal fans to sh- to like to shout down younger generations of fans who don't know him, who want to know about him, because this is what it's about. Keeping that alive, for me, it's always going to happen simply because of what he meant to me, but also because he is an Arsenal legend that needs to be appreciated for the way he conducted himself and played for our football club. He made me realise, and you mentioned it, we didn't really go into it, about when I was at his house, and we, I just signed. I was getting ready to go training. We stayed up till five in the morning, talking about Arsenal, talking about Tottenham, talking about how important it is to not lose against Tottenham, how important it is to carry yourself properly. Our Arsenal, oh, don't, can't do that. Oh my gosh, they'll go mad if you do this. <laughs> don't say that. Make sure you do. You know those kind of things. What the club meant to him is something that um, I, I, I can't express to people. But what I would like people to do is understand what he meant to the club. And when you look at the, the clips of what he'd done and where Arsenal started to kick into get into a position where they could start challenging everybody from 86 and from him and Tony Adams and Merce and all those guys that came, Dicko and Baldy and everybody that came, he, he was one of the catalysts of, that, the, of the start of everything. And that is why I feel as well that the fans... Arsenal fans will love him forever because they appreciated what he'd done for, for the club. Well, I think his legacy obviously lives on and in no small part because of you and because of the way that you speak about him and the way that you you share the life experiences that you had with him that were so obviously profound to you. And look, uh, I guess we send all our love to you today and his family and everyone else who misses him. Uh, and thank you for taking the time to do this. I know it's not necessarily an easy thing to talk about, but you've done it brilliantly and I'm sure everybody appreciates it. Thanks a lot, Andrew. I appreciate it, my friend. God bless you.